Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We will begin in a moment as more people continue to jump on the event today. Thank you for being here today. We will begin in just a moment as more people will join the call. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Great, thank you, Kay. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. During our virtual town hall last week, we had the opportunity to ask a, a number of questions around the university return to campus plan. In all, there were somewhere on the order of around 100 questions submitted, and we did not have time to ask them all. The Division of Communications has posted all of these questions on the Return to Campus website with answers to those that were submitted ahead of time and also those submitted during the live Q&A. You can see those questions at vu.edu slash faculty dash town dash hall. And again, that's vu, just the letters vu.edu slash faculty-town-hall. The same process will be the case for today as well. We have received a large number of questions ahead of time, and we'll also have time to take some live Q&A questions. While we won't be able to cover all of them, uh, these two will be posted with answers to those questions that are submitted. The Faculty Senate is also working with several of our schools and colleges to hold a series of local live Q&A sessions with our faculty. In late April, Interim Chancellor and Provost Wente created the University Continuity Working Group, which has been meeting continuously since it was formed. The UCWG is about 80 members strong with representation from all facets of university life from students, to staff, to faculty, to leadership. The UCWG is charged with providing recommendations across a very broad cross-section of the university life and giving those recommendations to our network of university leadership. The UCWG is comprised of a main working group with representation from all of the chairs of the three subcommittees, one on community and service, one on research, and one on education. Today, we are joined by three members of the Education Subcommittee, the Director for the Center of Teaching, Derek Bruff, and the co-chairs, Andre Christy Mizell and Mavis Shorn, whom Interim Chancellor uh, Wente will introduce uh, in full. I will now hand it over to Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Wente. 
Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you to all for attending this faculty town hall and your continued engagement and effort over these last weeks. I know that many of you likely participated in our faculty town hall last week, and it's available and recorded if you'd like to um, go back to it. When Vice Chancellor Kopstein, incoming Chancellor Daniel Diermeyer and I shared a preview of our return to campus plan. And as I mentioned in that meeting, our faculty members are the lifeblood of our university, and I'm grateful for all that you do. Your thoughtful questions and perspectives during that town hall and throughout this entire process have helped guide and inform our discussions and our planning for the semester ahead. Now, as mentioned, there's many ways for you to give your input. And I know that there's many questions that have come in and we set up this particular town hall to address questions that were coming in regarding um, the logistics of holding in-person classes with online or virtual components, really focusing on teaching. So our goal is to answer as many questions as possible. Um, we'll also be including answers on the website as John referenced. And to do that, we've brought together these um, three leaders today to um, really give perspectives and to give input. We're joined by Derek Bruff, who's the director of the Vanderbilt University Center for Teaching and a principal senior lecturer of mathematics. We're also joined by the two co-chairs of the Education Continuity Subcommittee, Mavis Shorn, who's professor of nursing and senior associate dean for academics in the School of Nursing, and Andre Christy Mazel, who's professor of sociology and dean of undergraduate education in the College of Arts and Science. I wanna thank them and thank their subcommittee for all the work that they're doing. I also wanna take just a minute to underscore that the decisions we have made regarding health and safety protocols, including classroom protocols, are based on data and advice from colleagues in the medical center, the school of nursing, as well as national, state, and local public health officials. We're really fortunate to have this expertise right here on our campus and we're utilizing it to the fullest extent possible at every single turn to ensure that we're protecting every person on campus as much as possible. Now, as this topic today for our forum is on teaching, I also want to firmly reinforce that we're working closely together on how to best support faculty who are teaching this coming semester and this next academic year. And I recognize completely in value and want to also firmly reinforce that curricular decisions are local and that teaching norms and expe expectations differ across disciplines and schools and colleges. So we have much we can learn from each other across the schools and colleges and we have much that we can do to help ensure excellence in our educational mission. But again, it'll be at your department level, at your school and college level that you can take all this information back to and then really help deploy and develop your plans. So after Derek's presentation, we're gonna leave time for additional questions that were submitted ahead of the event. And we also hope to answer your questions that come up during the town hall. So again, thank you for your commitment and I'm looking forward to listening and learning during this town hall. I'll hand it over to Derek. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you for that kind introduction and um, I'm grateful for the chance to speak with my faculty colleagues this morning for a little bit um, and address what is gonna be a challenging fall semester um, for the education uh, mission of the university. Um, I'm gonna let's see if my slides are working. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, this semester, uh, this fall semester, teaching is going to look a lot different for many of us. Um, and it won't really look the same for all of us either. Um, there's going to be a lot of variation across schools and colleges and different courses and classes. Um, I'm going to try to address a, a, a perhaps a common scenario this fall, one that I've, I've, I've heard a lot of concerns about from faculty. Um, and it's this. So the challenge would be that you know, this fall, you might have a class where half of your students are in the classroom, uh, sitting six feet apart and wearing masks, and the other half are participating virtually via video conference like Zoom. Um, this is not an ideal classroom environment. Um, uh, it's one that will be challenging, but it's one that a lot of us will be facing this fall. And so my goal today is to try to share some ideas and strategies for um, teaching effectively in this environment and trying to foster student engagement and active learning. Um, and I hope you'll leave feeling a little bit empowered um, uh, about the fall and how you might tackle 
uh, the, the, the teaching challenges that, that you face. First, I want to clarify a few terms. Um, there's a lot of different terms going around these days about different forms of teaching. And um, there's not always a high degree of consensus around these terms, but I thought at least we would have some, some working terminology for today. Face-to-face -to -face is probably the, the clearest term. This refers to teaching in which the teacher and the students are in the same room at the same time. This is what many of us are used to doing at Vanderbilt, although I have heard a few folks call it mask to mask lately. Um, online teaching refers to instruction which takes place via the internet, right? Um, this is when the uh, teachers and the students are not in the same room at the same time. Online teaching can be synchronous, like a Zoom session when you're online, but everyone's meeting at the same time. Or it can be asynchronous, like a Brightspace discussion board, where um, you're not interacting at the same time, um, but you're interacting online. There's another term called hybrid teaching. Um, hybrid teaching is that which involves some mix of face-to-face -face and online teaching. Uh, some out there uh, use the term more specifically. They mean particular structures for arranging the face-to-face -face and the online teaching components of a course. Um, I tend to use the term a little bit more broadly, um, just to say that it's a mix of some sort of um, online and face-to-face -face, uh, interactions for students. You'll also hear the term blended here sometimes, um, and that often means a, a similar thing to hybrid. One other term that you may have read about is high flex, which stands for hybrid flexible. Uh, this is actually a pretty uh, well-specified set of teaching strategies where the goal is to give students the choice to participate either face-to-face, -face, synchronously online, or asynchronously online. And in a high flex class, a student could actually kind of change their mind from week to week and participate in different ways. The flex and high flex refers to that flexibility that students have to decide how they want to interact. I've not been using high flex to describe how we'll be teaching this fall, mainly because I don't know that students will have as much agency as they would in a, in a kind of traditional high flex model. Um, that said, a lot of the teaching strategies that people who teach high flex have developed will be useful to those of us this fall because some of the context is similar. So now let's talk about that context a little bit. So um, what might your classroom look like this fall? Um, this is a, uh, I think this is from the law school um, as they're getting ready for the fall semester right here. Um, and again, uh, your context will vary a lot, but I'm imagining a lot of us will have a laptop with a microphone and a webcam that we'll bring into class. We'll be using Zoom uh, to help uh, bring in the virtual students uh, and you'll connect your laptop to the projector and the screen in the room. So imagine walking in, uh, you've got your laptop. Um, you're going to connect your laptop to the projector system. You'll fire up PowerPoint uh, if you have slides to share and Zoom as well. Um, you'll log in to Zoom. You'll point your laptop's webcam at you uh, and you'll share your screen. Um, at that point, your remote students can log in. They will see you and your screen through Zoom. Uh, so your slides, for instance, uh, and your in-person students will see the Zoom session on the big screen. So they will also see your slides. Um, again, some classrooms may vary. Um, some will have kind of extra AV options, including better cameras or better microphones. Um, but this basic setup will probably work in most places. It may be different for a lot of faculty, right? I now have a lot of colleagues who don't bring their laptop to class to teach, right? And so they use the classroom computer. And, um, it, this may involve a little bit of adaptation to your usual flow. Um, and I will say, as you know, a math instructor, some of you out there might prefer a whiteboard or a chalkboard <laughs> to a PowerPoint slide deck. And so one option would be to bring a separate tablet with a stylus, log into Zoom on that uh, tablet, uh, and then use the Zoom's whiteboard tool to do your hand, handwriting, right? Your remote students will see that via Zoom uh, through the whiteboard and your in-person students will see it on the big screen. You may not have a tablet with a stylus, right? Um, we, we have a lot of kind of challenges to solve this fall, but I would encourage you to talk with your department or program if there's hardware needs that you think that will be really important to your teaching this fall and, and kind of ask that way. So given that setup and that, again, that challenge, what might we do? Well, um, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna try to share a few strategies here that um, you might find helpful. There's no silver bullet. There's no kind of magic way to make this work beautifully. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be different for a lot of us as we, as we, uh, as we start this fall. Um, but the goal is to help our students engage, both our in-person students and our virtual students. 
Um, I'm going to be sharing a few highlights from a blog post I wrote a couple of weeks ago on the Center for Teaching website, cft.vanderbilt.edu. Uh, and you'll see that link later. Um, if you want to read more about anything I share today or see some additional strategies, we've got that right on the homepage where you can find it pretty easily. So here's one option, uh, live polling. Um, this is actually a question I've asked in my stats course in the past. It's a probability question that trips students up. Um, you know, Zoom has a, a live polling tool uh, that you can use to ask your students questions during class. Uh, it would be fairly easy for your remote students to participate in a Zoom poll. You might have to ask your in-person students to log into Zoom, uh, maybe mute their microphones and their cameras, just use the polling feature. Um, a well-designed question, even a multiple choice question like this, uh, can really challenge your students to apply what they're learning and provide you with a sense of how well they're learning it, right? When I see that graph, I have a sense of how my students are thinking about this particular mathematical concept. And then I can adjust my response um, uh, to, to be more responsive to kind of their particular learning needs. If the Zoom polling tool uh, isn't uh, practical for you, uh, it's, it's pretty limited, right? It does multiple choice questions pretty well. And so sometimes you want other options or it may be awkward to have your in-class students also being on Zoom at the same time. Um, you might consider other polling tools like Top Hat. Uh, Vanderbilt has a site license to Top Hat. Uh, it allows for a kind of fuller array of live polling tools and discussions that you may find helpful. Um, you could use it alongside Zoom Right, so again, this is gonna be new for a lot of us, running multiple windows during class time, right? But managing Zoom and managing Top Hat can be done, right? This is something we can learn to do. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so your students would have to as well, right? Your virtual students would have to participate via Zoom um, and Top Hat at the same time. Um, this does probably assume that your students in the classroom are gonna have a digital device with them of some sort. Um, uh, several of the strategies I've mentioned today will assume your students have a laptop or a tablet that they can access. And so that's something where if you've had a laptop ban in the class in the past, you might want to rethink that um, this semester, right? It's an exceptional semester. And so it's okay to, to make some exceptional teaching choices, I think. So another option is um, what I call the back channel. Um, so if you've participated in Zoom, you've probably seen the text chats on the side, right? That's an example of a back channel. The front channel is me talking at you right now, right? The back channel is all the conversations you're having with each other in the text chat. Um, and this can be uh, used to uh, supplement and enhance class discussion. Uh, students can use the back channel to take notes on the discussion, uh, to share resources, to ask questions of you or of each other, to suggest answers to each other, um, and to kind of connect with each other socially, right? This will be a nice way perhaps to help your virtual students and your in-person students interact um, a little more, a little less formally. Um, uh, one advantage of having a back channel conversation in your class is that it, it can form kind of a, um, not quite live captioning, right? It doesn't form that way, but the kind of the notes that students share in the back channel can be really helpful for students um, who may have access issues um, and can form a kind of documentation of the class discussion that can be helpful to look at later. Now, um, I'm expecting normal class discussion this fall to be pretty challenging. Um, uh, to have half your students or some portion of your students participating virtually, um, to have the students in the room with masks and being physically distanced, uh, kind of the normal class discussion may be quite challenging, right? Um, and so the back channel may be a really critical tool for engaging your students. Now, um, if you've ever tried to manage a back channel during class, uh, it's quite uh, hard. Um, I am, I would not be able to look at the text chat for this Zoom webinar right now while I'm presenting. Um, and so what I've learned to do is to have these voice of the chat roles in my, in my presentations or in my classes. Um, I'll appoint someone, um, it could be a teaching assistant, it could be a student um, that kind of rotates through different students over time. Uh, could even be a faculty colleague, right? You guys can kind of jump in and be each other's voice of the chat. But the idea is you would appoint someone who would pay attention to the chat during class. Um, and you would give yourself, I like to give myself a few moments in my presentation, right? I'll put a voice of the chat icon in my slides to remind myself that I need to stop and go see what's happening in the chat room and ask my voice, ask that representative to uh, verbalize whatever questions are coming there. Um, and so uh, this, this can work really well in a fully online environment. And I think it will be a helpful tool um, in the, the hybrid classroom this fall. I'll also add that, um, again, Zoom chat may not be kind of the, met, the best match for you. Um, you might look to other tools like um, Twitter or GroupMe, Slack, Discord maybe, 
Um, there are other kind of chat tools that you could decide to use with your, your students. Those would have the added advantage of being used perhaps outside of class time as well to kind of continue conversations and social connection. So group work. Um, how might group work work <laughs> this fall? Um, so here, here, here's an idea, and I've, I've done versions of this, and I, and I, think, I think some version of this idea um, is going to be really functional this fall. So, so what you're looking at now is actually a Google Sheet. It's a spreadsheet that I shared. Uh, this was at a workshop a few weeks ago that I gave, and so I, I shared a link to the group of faculty that I was working with. And they can all edit the Google spreadsheet together. It's like a Google Doc, but it's a spreadsheet. And so imagine having a, a, a spreadsheet like this that you shared with your students. You could um, say pose three discussion questions for your students. Uh, you put those questions at the top of the Google Sheet, right, one in each column. Uh, you ask your students to get into small groups to discuss those questions. Now, your in-person students, again, if they're physically distanced, uh, a group of size five or six may not be very functional in terms of discussion, but groups of two or three might be possible depending on the seating arrangements. Those students would discuss the questions with each other in person, uh, but the idea is that you invite all the student groups to the same Google Sheet where each group can take a different row and, and kind of report out on their group discussion. What are their group answers to the questions that you pose them? Meanwhile, your virtual students on Zoom can be doing the same thing. You can send them to breakout rooms in Zoom, and so they can have groups of two or three or even four or five in that case. Um, they'll have their own breakout room to talk about uh, the questions that you've posed, um, interact with each other, right? Kind of test their ideas against each other, and then use the Google Sheet to have those groups record out as well. Now, if you've never seen, you know, 30 or 50 people edit a Google Doc or a Google Sheet at the same time. It is a little disconcerting to see text appear everywhere, right? But one of the advantages of this reporting out mechanism is that it's structured, right? You've asked three questions and they're reporting those questions in three different columns. And, um, and you can monitor it as the group work is happening, right? It may be hard for you in a normal classroom, you might circulate among your students as they're working in groups and kind of eavesdrop or ask some questions. That won't be um, possible this fall in most cases. But you can see the students' work appear in the Google Sheet, and you can have a sense of how much progress they're making and what ideas they're bringing to the conversation. So that when it's time to bring everyone back together and you do some kind of synthesis or analysis of their comments, you've already seen what they've had to share, right? You don't have to have everyone report out again at that point. You can start to use um, their Google Sheet report out to inform the rest of class conversation that day. And of course, Google Sheets is not the only tool that you could use here. I like it because it's kind of simple and structured, and, and most people have a pretty easy time accessing Google Sheets. But depending on what you want your students to do during the group work activity, uh, you might use a Google Doc, you might use Google Slides, right? Each group could have a different slide that they're developing. Microsoft OneNote works similarly. Um, it could be an annotation tool like Perusal or Hypothesis or a virtual whiteboard tool like Mural or Miro or Padlet. And I just said a lot of words, right? So. Uh, you probably didn't write them all down and that's okay. Again, if you go to the CFT website, you'll see the blog post that has links to some of these tools if you'd like to learn more about them. So um, this is not as easy as having your students turn to their neighbor and talk, right? This is a lot more structure, right? But I think it's gonna have some potential for fostering meaningful small group conversations as well. A Couple more ideas. One is uh, the fishbowl method, which is actually a pretty classic discussion approach um, for class discussion. In a, in a more traditional setting, you would have some group of students in the middle who are gonna discuss the question of the day or the topic. Uh, and the rest of the students are outside that smaller circle, listening and observing, right? So you have the fish in the fishbowl and you have the rest of the students outside the fishbowl um, observing and reflecting. And it's an interesting conversational technique because it, it requires some students to listen more than maybe they would and some students to participate a little bit more than they would. And there's often a kind of phase one, phase two to this. Phase one is the students in the fishbowl talking about the topic of the day or sharing their perspectives. And then phase two is some type of analysis or summary even of the students who are listening. Um, and that can be helpful, right? For students who um, may not agree with the people in the fishbowl for them to sit and listen and then have to summarize that later. It's a helpful technique. In the hybrid classroom, I'm imagining that you could have some of your virtual students be in the fishbowl. Uh, they would be on the big screen at the front of the room and maybe not all of them, right? But you could you know, uh, recruit four or five students uh, who are participating via Zoom to have the discussion. 
and all the other students would then listen, take notes, reflect, um, do that part of the fishbowl activity. And the advantage of this is that the um, with the challenges of hearing each other speak in a physically distanced classroom, um, this might work actually pretty well, right? As I'm imagining the classroom AV setup, it would be pretty easy to hear the students who are participating via Zoom. Um, it's gonna be harder for the students in the classroom to be heard by the students on Zoom. Um, and so this doesn't solve that problem, right? But it kind of leans into that particular dynamic with the discussion structure that um, has been shown to work really well for Frost during class discussion. The last idea is really a spin on the classic model of think pair share, right? This is uh, a really useful discussion strategy that a lot of faculty use regularly. Uh, you pose a question, you have students think about it on their own for a minute or two, um, then you have them pair up and talk about it, right? You may ask them to come to consensus or disagree about it um, or just discuss their answers. And then you have them share out with the whole class. This is a great structure because it gives students time to kind of collect their thoughts, come up with a response, vet that response with someone else before they have to share it with the whole class. Now, as I said, it may be a little hard to have students turn to their neighbor and talk this fall, right? But imagine if instead of at that pair stage, instead of having your students turn to their neighbor or walk across the room to talk to someone they don't usually talk to, uh, what, if, what if they Zoomed or FaceTimed with one of the virtual students? Um, at, there's a bit of a matching problem here, but I can imagine if you've got students in the room with some earbuds or headphones and you've previously matched the in-person students to the virtual students, right, one-to-one, -one, they could load up FaceTime or Zoom and have a one-to-one -one conversation um, uh, with each other. Uh, this, I think, might be, once you've done this a few times, this may be a pretty fluid way to involve some pair discussion during class, and it has the added benefit of connecting your virtual students to your in-person students. Um, who may not regularly interact with each other uh, in other ways. So I kind of like this simple method for taking a, a strategy that works really well and making it um, perhaps a little bit more possible in this fall's classes. So I'm gonna wrap up my portion here um, before we go to Q&A. And I just wanna emphasize that no one has done this before. Uh, uh, there are folks who have taught in this high flex model, right? Um, and I know we have colleagues at the School of Nursing who have had remote students and physical students at the same time. Um, but we haven't done this with the physical distancing and the masks, right? This is, this is new territory. It's new for us. Uh, there's not a literature on how to do this well, right? There's not research on how to do this well. Um, it's new for our colleagues at other institutions, right? We're not the only ones who are wondering how on earth are we going to kind of figure this out. Um, it's also new for our students, right? This is going to be very strange territory for our students. And so um, I wanna encourage you to talk with your students about this novel approach to learning uh, and be willing to change things if your initial strategies aren't working, right? Um, again, this is not an ideal teaching environment, but most of 2020 has been less than ideal. I think, however, if we approach this fall with some creativity, some determination and some collaboration with each other, we can make the most of this challenging situation. And I'll leave you with this. Um, at the Center for Teaching, we're, we've been working hard all summer to try to help faculty get ready. And so I'll just let you know about a couple of opportunities that you might take advantage of as you prepare for the fall. We have an online course design institute. It's a two week experience. Um, we're running it every two weeks all summer. We've had about 250 faculty move through it already and we're on track for a lot more this fall. Um, we also have a series of online course visits set up. If you'd like to see how someone else is building out their online course, um, uh, we can uh, arrange that and you can even have a Zoom call with the host. Uh, we also have Brightspace support, right? We are the home base for Vanderbilt's course management system and our team is standing by to help you with lots of technical questions and pedagogical questions. I do want to point out that uh, we're focusing in some of our efforts on online course design um, because for a lot of us, we're quite used to teaching in face-to-face -face environments. It's the online piece that's really new. And so there's a lot of methodologies and experience from those who teach online regularly that we can draw from to inform our hybrid teaching. And for those of us who are teaching fully online this year, our online teaching as well. Um, and so that's why we're focusing on online because we think it's a nice starting point for our faculty to expand into a whole set of teaching strategies. And if you'd like to learn more about the Center for Teaching and um, our resources, again, the website is cft.vanderbilt.edu. I thank you for your time and attention. And now I believe I'm turning it over to John to handle our Q&A. 
Thank you, Derek. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate your acknowledgement of uh, what we might come to know as the grand experiment, since we haven't done this before. <laughs> uh, for our Q&A session, uh, our panelists will be Derek, but we're also joined by Andre Christy Mizell and Mavis Schorn, who co-chair the University Continuity Subcommittee on Education. We're really grateful for all of your time. Um, now, to give you a sense of the subcommittee, it has representation from all of the schools and colleges across the university. Now, recognizing that there may be differences between undergraduate, graduate, and professional training, uh, I would ask our panelists when certain questions come up, if you could try to distinguish uh, the differences that, that we might encounter, that one might be, be able to expect that, that we would see between those. And so, so my first question, um, I'd like to ask Andre, um, and it's a big question, Andre, so I apologize in advance, but when will the schedule be settled? Well, to be sure, the fall schedule um, is the most complicated schedule that we have ever had to create. Um, fall planning combined with the current um, combined with the current circumstances have required that faculty, administrators, departments, programs be more flexible than ever. So the University Registrar's Office or the URO has been working with all 10 schools and colleges um, to produce this schedule. Each school or college has determined procedures for requesting from faculty or programs or departments what courses they'd like to teach uh, and in what uh, modality they would like to teach it. Um, again, the role of the URO has been pivotal in getting the fall schedule completed, both in terms of assigning courses to rooms um, and putting together the revised schedule. Uh, none of this would be possible without our colleagues, Registrar Bart Quinette, Vice Provost Doug Christiansen, and their teams who continue, who continue to work tirelessly to plan and implement the new schedule. Um, what I'll do next to sort of get to your question about when it'll be settled and when faculty will know what they're teaching, if it's in person or online and how many students will be enrolled, is I'll go over with you the undergraduate timeline. Um, there are, of course, overlaps with graduate and professional schools, um, given that we share the same campus. Um, but for the most part, the most unsettled portion of the schedule at this point would be the undergraduates. So from about mid-May to the 1st of June, um, Vice Chancellor Eric Kopstein and his team surveyed campus looking for at classroom spaces, um, implementing physical distancing, telling us that a classroom that would um, normally hold an enrollment of 40 will now hold an enrollment of 18. So very careful work um, so that we know which um, spaces um, are available. Meanwhile, the URO is meeting with undergraduate and associate deans um, to plan on how to adjust the schedules. And in the various schools, chairs, uh, directors of undergraduate studies are being asked to talk to their faculty to modify plans. We also, and we can talk a little bit about this later, there are lots of discussions about facilities and IT and how to, what the te technology requirements will be for each room. So all of that is also being worked on. So that brings us to the month of June. So with sophomores, juniors, and seniors having already registered, we are now advising, onboarding, and letting uh, incoming first years and transfer students register. They will be registering through uh, June 26th. And we have pretty much kept the schedule that we had in the spring in place. Starting on the 26th, this Friday, we will take a look at the schedule. Um, the URO will run an analysis we will put courses in classrooms. Um, during the time where we were looking at physical distancing and what our requirements would be for classes, we found about 200 spaces that we're gonna be able to use for classrooms um, that weren't normally um, classrooms. And so we'll have some additions. It also means that across campus that we share space. Um, so our colleagues in Peabody may be teaching over in arts and science space and vice versa. We really have to all work together um, to, to make this happen. Um, in addition to figuring out during this period of time at the end of the month into mid-July, 
um, where courses will fit. We're also figuring out the block schedule. So with physical distancing, with the requirements that uh, the current situation um, brings, um, we'll need more time between classes. Right now, it's about it's going to be 20 minutes between classes. That's the current um, that's the current plan. In the middle of July, we will have a new schedule that will be after many iterations going back and forth with the URO and with the various undergraduate schools, um, the four undergraduate schools, we'll have a new schedule and it'll be published in YES. Students will then have an opportunity to do what we call schedule adjustment. They will receive something from the URO that says, here's your current schedule. Here's the schedule that you registered for. And here are now the conflicts given the new time constraints we have, uh, classroom constraints, now that this course is going to be taught online, now that this is a large, big themed course, um, here are the conflicts and you, here's your window to adjust your schedule. That will be done in order of seniority. So we will let our seniors have their windows first, juniors, sophomores, first years transfers and so forth. Um, they will be able to, in the middle of July, add those courses to their yes cart and then actually have those registration windows during the last week of July. That's an additional step. We will still have what we call open registration, which we always have, which students can make then final adjustments to their schedules. They can perhaps confer with their advisor. They can think about um, other things that they hope to accomplish um, and we'll still have from August 10th through the 31st for um, registration. So the schedule will be settled in mid-July. Students will then be able to adjust their schedules and they'll have two opportunities to do so, what we're calling the schedule adjustment period and open registration. As we're figuring out how our courses fit into classrooms, we may have to increase caps. We may have to reduce caps in terms of enrollment. Um, some courses may um, have more students online than they have in the classroom. So one of the things that I would like to ask and being a little bit familiar with this process is I would just like to ask for everybody's patience. So if you're speaking to our students, ask for their patience, I'm asking you for your patience, but please know that there are teams and teams of people working behind the scenes uh, to make all of this work. I really appreciate that very detailed response, Andre. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. Um, so, the next question uh, I'd like to ask, ask Mavis. So this is uh, a multi-part question. So what can faculty expect regarding remote student participation in courses this fall? How will faculty learn which students will be participating remotely in their classes? We expect to have students attending who are in vastly different time zones, international students, for example. What assumptions should we make about their ability to engage during scheduled class times? All right, so I will I'll attempt to cover all those questions. So, um, you know, I think we all have to expect that there are going to be some students in all programs across campus that'll, that will need to shift from in-person to remote during the semester. It may be for quarantine because of exposure. It could be for isolation because they have a positive test, um, but we're gonna have to be prepared for that. If they're healthy and in quarantine, we can expect them to participate online with the class as scheduled. If they're sick, they may be mildly sick and want to participate online, and that's fine. If they're very sick and can't participate, we'll accommodate them the same way we currently do with students who are sick now and can't make it to class. For undergraduate students, we can expect that some students who know this summer that they need to participate remotely, uh, that they need to participate remotely this fall, students have to request this remote only status by this Friday, June 26th. It's expected that classes will be taught in the central time zone for all students. There will be some courses that will be designated as in person only because of the nature of the content or the activities. You can imagine some particular lab classes or certain courses that have um, major activities in them that are experiential that really are not um, possible to turn into an online environment. And those courses will be designated as such. 
we'll still need to prepare no matter what, no matter which course, we still are going to have to prepare for students who may need episodic uh, online availability in their course. If, if, uh, if you have, as a faculty, if you have unique situations about teaching your course in an exclusively online format or, or even in this um, episodic format, please talk with your local chair or dean um, about that. Now, graduate and professional schools have unique needs related to teaching students exclu exclusively online. If graduate and professional school faculty are not certain whether students will be allowed to register for your course completely online, check with your department chair or your associate dean in accordance with your usual processes. Thank you, Mavis. So, <clears throat> and, and I think it, it sort of struck me during Derek's presentation that, you know, there are various expectations as, as you also just described. So Derek, I wanted to ask you, I know the CFT has a lot of wonderful tools and programmatic activities that are going on. And I think you said maybe 250 people have participated, for example, in the, the more intensive one. So if you're going to try to meet all of these expectations, uh, what, what should faculty do to go about designing courses for the fall given sort of this these differences in expectation. Yeah, so we're going to need to be adaptive in our course design approach, right? So whether it's students who are starting uh, the semester remote or have to shift to remote um, participation, um, there's, as Mavis outlined, there's a lot of different configurations that are going to be possible and things, conditions may change as we go. Um, so I think there's a, a, a few kind of principles here that I would point people to. Um, uh, one is, uh, this process we use in a lot of our work at the Center for Teaching around backwards design. And that there the idea is to really focus on what your learning objectives are for your students and design your course around that. Really know what you want them to know, to understand, to be able to do, and then to kind of align your assessments and your learning activities around those objectives. Uh, as we've worked with folks in the Online Course Design Institute this summer, many of them have found it very helpful to kind of go back and rethink, what is this course really about? What am I trying to teach? And what are some methods I can use to try to get students there? And so that backwards design approach um, is, is very helpful. Um, I think also, as I said, thinking about um, more online components to your course, right? Even if you're expecting most of your students in person this fall in some configuration, thinking about kind of how can we have more elements of our course work well online? Um, are there online tools or strategies that you might learn over the summer to kind of be prepared for that? Uh, if you have a course that already has some online components and for some reason you have to do more online work with students or have more students participate online, you're in a better position to start that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the third one is, is thinking intentionally about your synchronous time and your asynchronous time. And a lot of faculty, I mean, they do this all the time, right? We've got in a traditional setting, you've got a, maybe 150 minutes a week with your students in the classroom. And you think, what do I want students to do outside of that time? And what do I want them to do during that time? And you may rethink some of those choices this fall, right? Some of those things that used to be easy in the classroom may be easier online, right? Um, and maybe vice versa, right? And so thinking intentionally about with the time that I have my students, either in person or synchronously, right, at the same time, what's the best use of those activities? And it may be that you find that, you know, that 10 minute explanation of that hard topic that you have to give every fall, that might make a really great video that you prepare in advance and have students watch on their own time, right? And have more of that synchronous time to have students interact with each other. There's no right answer here, right? Um, but I think thinking through your goals and objectives, um, being open to a lot of online strategies, and then being really intentional with your synchronous and asynchronous time will really help. I appreciate that. If I could, I'd like to ask a follow up to that, where we've received a number of questions. And I know, um, given that you've written a book on technology in the classroom, uh, I find you quite qualified to answer this. <laughs> so what technologies can can faculty expect to see in their classrooms? And then sort of the converse of that is uh, how should how do you recommend the faculty manage if they're not in one of those enhanced classrooms? And that is sort of a lack of technology. And also, do you have any word on when faculty will have the opportunity to, to practice teaching, if they so choose, in their classroom before the start of the semester? 
All very good questions. <laughs> yes. So I would separate between classroom technologies and other technologies, right? So we have things like Zoom and Brightspace and Top Hat. There are other technologies that operate kind of fully online um, that faculty have access to at Vanderbilt, right? We've provided centralized access to a lot of these tools. Um, for the classroom technologies, yes, I think um, uh, there's about 90 classrooms that are getting kind of an enhanced AV package over the summer. Um, in those classrooms, uh, they'll have uh, kind of better web cameras built in um, and uh, ceiling microphones that will pick up more of the classroom audio. Faculty will still connect to those via their laptop or the podium computer um, and still run Zoom, right, in kind of how I described, but um, you'll have a better camera and a little better microphone to pick up, pick up audio. Um, if, uh, if you're not in one of those classrooms, um, we are going to have to do some testing to kind of see um, how it's going to work, right? And, and faculty are used to this. You come into a new classroom you haven't taught there before, and you've got to figure out the AV, right? right? And so we'll have to do some figuring out. Um, and we'll see some things will probably work better than we expect, and some things may work a little worse. Um, I do think learning to use your own laptop, right, as a, as a classroom uh, teaching tool will be helpful, um, although podium computers um, play a role as well. Um, a couple of other things. Um, if you're going to record, uh, one thing I didn't address earlier is kind of recording the, the synchronous class session and making that available to students um, who, who, who can't participate synchronously for one reason or another. I think Zoom is going to be your best bet for that. If you're already facilitating class via Zoom, you can do a recording for that pretty easily. It'll record up to the cloud and then later you can download that video and then add it to your Brightspace course so all of your students can see that. Um, the Center for Teaching's Brightspace support site has a nice walkthrough on how to do precisely what I just described. Um, and so I think once you've done it a couple of times, it'll be, it'll be pretty routine. You asked about um, kind of training and practice. And so um, I've been working with Jermaine Soto, who is the Director of Faculty Development. And we've been collaborating uh, with uh, VUIT, um, some of my CFT colleagues. Uh, we're working on a training schedule uh, for the summer. Uh, we expect, expect to post that schedule um, fairly soon, probably in the next two weeks, um, to let faculty know when they can kind of train in different ways. Uh, there will be trainings for the new classroom technology and the use of existing hardware, right, including those classrooms that don't have those extra features. Um, that'll be probably late July and August. Uh, we'll have a training trainings available for that. Uh, the trainings will be offered in person. Uh, some of them will be live streamed. Uh, some of them will be recorded. So we're hoping to kind of give faculty some access to those different ones. We're going to do a few test runs before that, right? And so um, you may have seen the story inside higher ed today about other campuses that are doing test runs um, for the fall. And so I'm excited to work with some colleagues around that as well. Um, uh, I think that's it. Um, Yes, uh, it looks like I think closer in August, we'll have, again, kind of more opportunities for faculty to do trial runs in their own classrooms, right? So we'll have some kind of trainings midsummer, and then I think the goal is to have some opportunities for faculty to test out their particular rooms in August. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, I appreciate that. So we've received a number of questions about uh, safety in the classroom. And so Mavis, uh, if I could, I'd like to ask, uh, how are physical distancing and other safety protocols for classrooms uh, this fall being determined? Well, there are several committees that are working really hard on developing these safety protocols for the classroom, and that includes concerns that the faculty have about teaching in a mask. Um, these committees have do have faculty on them, as well as experts in the area of public health and facilities. There are investigations in progress regarding the, uh, you know, how practical are things, as well as how well do they, how well do they work, um, to assist faculty in, you know, being able to project and, and speak clearly, but also have a barrier and, and stay safe in the classroom. Um, some of these items are things like face shields or, or mobile plexiglass barriers. Um, these committees are very welcome. They're welcoming other ideas and you, there'll be a place here that you can um, submit either questions or even comments related to this. So, so suggestions are welcome uh, and many options are being investigated uh, based on recommendations from, from faculty, from public health experts and from peer institutions. There'll, there'll be more communication that'll be coming out with faculty about opportunities for feedback as well as final decisions as the summer continues to progress. 
No, thank you, Mavis. And um, so Andre, I, I know you addressed part of this and talking about sort of the schedule being finalized and you ask for flexibility. We have, we've, we've received a number of, of questions as well from faculty about um, what the students are hearing and the communications around that. And so if you could, uh, what kinds of messages are the students receiving about their choice in returning to campus and about attending class in person while, while at campus? Um, undergraduate students are receiving key messages right now from the university registrar's office about deadlines, about registration. Um, they have also received information recently from interim chancellor and provost Linty. Um, those messages are uh, about returning to campus, featuring the university helpline, um, and are posted on the website. For the most part, students also receive follow-up messages from the dean's office of their own college or school. Um, maybe indicating things that are key to that particular um, area of study. Undergraduate students are being given the choice to come to campus to take or to take classes remotely. The deadline for them to make this choice um, is June 26th. Um, for graduate and professional students, they also get messages that are to the Vanderbilt community from the interim chancellor and provost. Um, the valuable information also comes to them from their graduate and professional schools as well. So in general, graduate students are being asked to return uh, to residents um, on campus similar to faculty. However, their situations are being handled at the local level, that is by the individual colleges and schools. Thank you, Andre. So as kind of a follow-up and sort of um, given the complexities and the, the need for flexibility, uh, when can faculty reach out to their students, given sort of the, the different aspects that you, you mentioned about registration and what can faculty tell their students should their students be reaching out to them? I know from the faculty that I've heard from that there's some nervousness about being in touch with our students. Nobody wants to give them incorrect information. So what I would say is, as always, faculty may reach out to students to answer their questions at any time. It just may be that you don't know the answer right now or you need to find the answer. Um, I would suggest that faculty um, take the time to review the various FAQs that are posted online um, that come through the chancellor and provost offices um, and to make sure that they have the most up-to-date information for students. That may include contacting your dean's office um, if you have a particular question. Um, as I did sort of in my initial response to the question about the schedule, I would um, ask for, um, ask faculty to remind students to be patient, that we are keeping them in mind and that we're working hard on their behalf and that our main goal um, is that they make academic progress and that they have a quality educational experience. Um, and I think from the students that I'm hearing from, especially through the Dean's Office in Arts and Science, I think letting them know about the opportunity, they know something's going on with the schedule, letting them know in mid-July that that will all change and they, they will have an opportunity to fix their schedule or to adjust their schedule, I think will go a long way. Okay, and um, sort of following along from Derek's question, Andre, I'd like to ask you if I could, uh, what assumptions can faculty make about student access to technology, uh, both the internet and other technologies as they're, they're preparing for their fall classes? So clearly we know a little bit more about what students on campus will have access to. Um, for those who are off campus, it may be variable. So on campus beyond our existing uh, borrowing programs for laptops and other equipment, um, there is still the COVID-19 Student Hardship Relief Fund, which students may still apply for um, in order to get help if they need, um, um, if they need various uh, resources. Um, additionally, in the same way that students receive financial aid packages to purchase books or other classroom materials, they may also, through financial aid, apply for additional help if they need um, resources. And so one of the most important things to do when we hear from students, if they need aid, is to make sure that they are in touch with the Dean of Students Office and financial aid. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's good to know that. And I, I know in a number of different contexts, I've heard 
um, a large number of our faculty asking about um, about their safety and welfare. And so Mavis, if I could uh, return to you for a moment, um, what kinds of contingency plans are there for faculty who are sick and will faculty be expected to teach their classes uh, if they're in quarantine? So it's a great question. We've been talking a lot about, you know, accommodating for students, but faculty, as faculty, we may also be exposed and have to be in quarantine or, or even become positive and have to be isolated. So, uh, you know, if we're, if we're in quarantine uh, or our sickness, if we do have, have a positive COVID screen and we're, we're, you know, sick, but not, but able to teach, we'll need to teach that online. So that's the advantage of going ahead and preparing your courses in an online format, not just to meet student needs, but also to meet your own needs as a teacher if you have to revert to that. Um, if, you are, um, if, if you are very sick, of course you would not be able to teach. And then your normal steps that you would do at the local level of your, your chair or um, leadership in your school would help you with who's going to cover your cat class when you're not able to do that. So um, there's there are also some discussions in progress about how to support faculty who may have difficulty teaching, not because necessarily because of quarantine, but because of other issues related to the pandemic, like childcare issues if school's not in, or you know something like that. And uh, there's there's work being done in that area uh, to support faculty, and we should be hearing more about that soon, as um, whenever those resources are are clarified a bit more and finalized. So it's, you know, it's possible that if the pandemic worsens in the fall, we may even be asked to go completely remote again. So uh, we hope that that doesn't happen, but it could. So having courses that are designed as adaptive as possible, whether you have to adapt it because of you, because of needs that you as faculty have, or because of your students, it's gonna be really important this fall. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and given time, um, I, I think we have time for a couple more questions, but I do want to remind everyone that's joined us that uh, there, there will be on, on the website at bu.edu uh, slash faculty dash town dash hall answers to all of the questions that we've been receiving. Um, and there are a couple questions that I think would be really helpful because they're, they're coming in uh, from a number of different, different spaces. Uh, Andre, um, this is primarily towards our undergraduates, but affects our faculty in all of our schools and colleges, and it's around immersion. Um, could you tell us anything about the immersion plans for this year? Yes, um, we will move forward with immersion Vanderbilt this fall. Those students who were supposed to declare their plans um, in the spring have a new deadline. That new deadline is September 7th. Um, and as you know, immersion experiences are broad and include a wide, wide, a wide array of um, activities ranging from academic to applied. This fall, students who may not be able to work on one aspect of their immersion experience will simply be encouraged to work on another aspect. So perhaps the lab work you were planning this fall can't happen right away because of physical distancing. Perhaps you'll start with the lit review or the coursework that you were going to do, some other aspect. Um, there will be more information forthcoming about how we will implement, implement immersion differently. Uh, in fact, Vice Provost Vanessa Beasley will be meeting with the Faculty Steering Committee uh, for Immersion Vanderbilt in July, developing those specific guidelines and then sharing those with the campus community. Okay, th thank you, Andre. Uh, and, and one last question um, for the time that we have. Uh, Mavis, um, could, you, could you comment on the ability of faculty to include their own mask wearing enforcement in their syllabi? Well, uh, this is a little bit tricky. So, um, you know, it's helpful certainly for faculty for us to reinforce the helpful and necessary for us to reinforce the, the university protocols. Um, the language in the syllabus, you may want to keep pretty broad about that. Because we can, you know, 
while um, we can't modify the university safety requirements in our at the course level. So we need to follow what the university guidelines are. And then at the same time, those guidelines may need to change. They may need to get stricter during the semester or they may need to be more relaxed during the semester, depending on how this pandemic progresses. So our recommendation would be is not putting pandemic specific guidelines within the syllabi. Okay. That that's good guidance. So I would like to, to thank you, all of our panelists. Uh, thank you profoundly for your time and, and adding your insights. I understand that these town halls are, are short and there are lots of questions. So once again, I'll remind everyone that's joined us that you can go to vu.edu slash faculty dash town dash hall. And in the coming days, all of the answers to the questions submitted today will be posted. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Interim Chancellor and Provost Wente, uh, if you would like to make any closing remarks. Well, I just wanna share my thanks again to everyone who's working so hard and so carefully on developing these plans and thinking forward in terms of how to best support um, excellence in education and teaching. I'm incredibly proud of our faculty. I am incredibly heartened by um, the commitment that I feel um, from each and every one of you and your concern about how do we do this right? And I know we'll find a way to do it right. I'm confident. That's because, um, not because we're Vanderbilt, it's because we are faculty professors. We're devoted to this. It's why we, we went into this career track. So I, I wanna thank you and I want to reinforce um, my respect for your tremendous effort. I know also that um, we'll continue hosting these university-wide town halls on different topics as we see a convergence of questions in specific areas. But I also know that your respective um, college and school deans have already had or are having and in the process of having interactive town halls or small group meetings, department meetings, where you can ask more questions, get more information, have discussions about your college and school's plans and give input into them for the fall. So thank you and I hope to connect again and I really hope to continue hearing um, how we're gonna continue moving forward and how we can help you. Thank you. Thank you, much appreciated.